Can can you guys see it? Yep. Okay. All right. That worked out. The um <clears throat> oops. Um yeah, I didn't review this ahead of time because I like to wing it because PowerPoints become boring. So uh uh we'll just kind of have a discussion. I have to finish by one. Um so it may be uh <clears throat> I may finish a bit early, but punchline is you know, as Joanna demonstrated earlier today, it's obviously hep C has things outside the liver that are absolutely fascinating um, that reward uh, hunting on occasion for them. And the, the mechanisms whereby we have these uh, different illnesses are uh, from various causes. But I mean, this is a nice reminder. Hepatitis C is in a family of viruses that we respect um, greatly in their ability to cause systemic illness and uh, and, and sort of a, a lot of um, morbidity. And uh, just to put some names of other flavy viruses up there to scare us. The um, extra hepatic manifestations are not the same as symptoms. Uh, at least I, I differentiate them in my mind. So remember the symptoms of hepatitis C is a lot like um, you just presented on your last patient, probably feeling lousy. It speaks to the you know, concepts that having a systemic viremia and chronic inflammation makes you feel poorly. You know, this is well recognized for some disease processes, but really took a long time to be recognized in hepatitis C and uh, really took um, good treatments uh, that were relatively side effect free for us to recognize that, oh yes, in fact, hepatitis C does make you feel poorly because when you treat it, you feel better, at least in some situations. And, and, you know, that was masked greatly during the interferon era when we used to use a medicine that made you feel like you were going to die for a year. And then when we stopped it, people felt better. And we thought it was because the interferon was done. Um, yes, that was true, but it was also probably because your, uh, your hepatitis C was no longer causing you to ache and hurt all over. You know, a lot of this stuff is that which cytokines cause, you know, just you got the brain fog and the feeling achy and painy and so on and so forth. So the extra hepatic manifestations, nobody knows how common they are, but it does reward looking uh, on physical exam and review systems and really trying to connect the dots in past medical history. It's not uncommon to see a disease process um, listed separately in somebody's past medical history that may have some association, correlation, or even causality from, uh, from hep C. And um, a lot of times those are autoimmune diseases, um, and so on and so forth. Mechanistically, uh, how does hepatitis C cause damage in other parts of the body? You know, this is the various mechanisms to have up here. There are there's some other tissue tropism besides just the hepatocytes. So you can actually have direct tissue damage in some areas. That's uh, really the, uh, the immune system that we blame and the frustrated immune response that causes a lot of the issues and also the deposition of the evil humor, sort of the uh, immune complex deposition in various organs that cause, uh, that cause the problem. Um, remember that inflammatory milieu causes cardiovascular risk. So remember, I, I always remember being fascinated in, uh, when I was first learning on rheumatologic conditions and what kills patients with rheumatologic conditions is cardiovascular disease. And that was just one of those things that made you go, Hmm, you know, that's, uh, to, to quote CNC music factory there, you know, but, but truly it made you just wonder like, what, why do people with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and psoriatic arthritis die of cardiovascular disease. And it's um, you know, a combination of that, that chronic inflammation is not good for the vascular system. And the same thing holds true for the chronic inflammation of uh, hepatitis C. Um, this is a really important statement in bold. Okay, is it does not necessarily correlate with hepatic fibrosis. So we're so used to triaging our sort of concern for a patient based upon how much damage has been done to the liver. You know, that's a... Uh, you know, tells us how much hepatic reserve they have, their risk for hepatocellular carcinoma, et cetera. But, um, but it uh, doesn't always correlate. Remember the natural history of hep C is a good one third of people never develop significant uh, hepatic fibrosis. But if that same patient has chronic inflammation and an and immune system that's being flogged for several decades, um, you can develop significant extra hepatic stuff going on. So, and then the last part says, you know, we, we really don't know how to predict how things will go after treatment. We assume symptoms will get better um, and some of the extra hepatic manifestations um, should improve. Uh, mechanistically, it makes sense. 
if you cut down on inflammation or you stop activating the immune system, things should get better, but it doesn't often happen quickly. It requires patience and time uh, because we're often talking the immune system calming down, which is not immediate. It's a slow process and it doesn't always get better. Um, still worth treating. And this is just a slide that says it's, it's meant everywhere. So you pick the system and you can find issues galore. And, uh, and, um, and really I want to underline this thing, any autoimmune disease. I, I just this week, I can't remember what it was that we, oh yeah, it was a, one of our rheumatologists had um, diagnosed sort of a pseudo crest syndrome on a patient. And um, the underlying that was hep C. So it's really kind of any autoimmune disease. If you cease an autoimmune disease on somebody's past medical history, um, try to see if there's a connection. Um, uh, you can conceptually often imagine there would be, especially if it's an antibody mediated disease, such as rheumatoid or lupus, et cetera. Um, but really, I, I tend to hit PubMed and Google um, whenever I see an autoimmune disease in somebody's past medical history and go from there. But I'll go through kind of these other ones as quickly as I can uh, and, and not be um, complete, but just to give you general gist. So it's fascinating that, you know, the first major slide I have for subtopics is endocrine. Notably missing from there is anything about low testosterone or, uh, um, you know, elevated sex hormone binding globulin. Um, it's a uh, one more impressive mechanism that I honestly, gosh, was not even aware of the concept of uh, increased sex hormone binding globulin in hepatitis C patients, but apparently that happens. But just be a lumper, and a, and a lumper would say there are gland problems, there are endocrine problems in people with uh, hepatitis C. The thyroid is the one that gets the most attention, hypo, hyper, uh, and mechanistically, that can be Graves' disease, it can be Hashimoto's. Again, thyroid dysfunction, really common. So worthy of checking a TSH on all your hepatitis C patients. Diabetes and hepatitis C, you know, your little pancreatic islet cells can have dysfunction from direct um, tissue tropism. There's a sort of a, a negative feedback with hepatitis C and diabetes where diabetes makes the rate of fibrosis progress more rapidly and hepatitis C makes your A1C uh, worse. So kind of everything negative that one disease can do to the other, that's what hep C and diabetes do to each other. So yeah, just be alert and aware of that. And that's all that says. I think it just says everything I just said. Um, and other gland stuff. What other glands are known to be involved? The glands of your eyeballs and your salivary glands. Um, the kidney. So the kidney is a, often a bystander organ. Obviously, the things that um, often affect the kidney are the blood vessels and the glomeruli, and, uh, and both of which can be susceptible to uh, sort of... Um, insults in the setting of hepatitis C. And a lot of the time is that chronic immune activation leads to immune complex deposition and the, and, and the special vasculitis that you can get from hepatitis C. Cryoglobulinemia can also affect the kidneys. So uh, worthy of getting a UA. The punchline is worthy of getting a UA and assessing creatinine in your patients. And, and again, what you're looking for is blood and protein, anything to signify um, uh, glomerular disease or, or intrinsic renal disease. Um, this is the, the, like one of the scarier concepts that happens, you know, you, 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 any chronic infection, um, frustrates the immune system. And, uh, and it doesn't matter if it's a, uh, syphilis, Lyme disease, endocarditis, osteomyelitis, hepatitis B, C, any, anything the body can't cure on its own. It doesn't just sit there passively. It's that they're doing stuff. And, and one of the things it does is it sort of just non-specifically activates itself, and, and as a spinoff of that, some bad things can happen. Yes, we talked about the chronic inflammation. You can also have more specific negative things that happen down the road. You can get monoclonal gammopathy if you get a, a B cell line that just like keeps proliferating. And that can even uh, progress all the way to, um, to, to uh, a lymphoma, usually a B cell lymphoma. So that's kind of a terrifying concept that you can stimulate the immune system and flog it so long for so hard that it can become an autoproliferative disorder and actually uh, turn into a, a, a heme malignancy. So some scary stuff. That's why, um, you know, that, that uh, case Joanna talked about, the thing in the back of my mind I worry about a little bit is uh, a perineoplastic syndrome. Any, anytime you get any protein produced at an absolute anomalous rate in the body, um, you, you, you worry about perineoplastic production. And I know Kaylee was talking about that too, and she was talking about the, the scrotal ultrasound. We're just looking sure to make sure that there's not a neoplastic process. So remember that uh, first patient wasn't F4 and looked, would be prone to hepatocellular carcinoma. Those patients um, also, you know, the chronicity involved was long and uh, that adenopathy doesn't necessarily have to be from HCC. So the person that had an AFB that was normal 
Um, but you, in the back of my mind, I, I do worry a little bit about, um, you know, neoplastic processes. Anytime you see a large lymph node in a patient with um, HCC or HCV, um, uh, sorry, HCV. Uh, so hopefully that patient is okay. But just remember the, about that risk for uh, cancer, um, blood cancers. Another weird concept, you know, cryoglobulinemic vasculitis. That's a good mouthful, but um, it's just a, a one more consequence of this aberrant antibody production. And just by chance, some of those antibodies um, can deposit the immune complex deposits in uh, in, in in certain tissues, including the skin, causing a cryoglobulinemic uh, vasculitis, leukocytoclastic vasculitis. They can also deposit in the joints and the kidneys, and, and you can have uh, symptomatic cryoglobulinema. Um, this is what it might look like on the legs. And uh, and the punchline is there's algorithms what to do about it. In, in general, you just want to treat the hep C, but on occasion, you may have to shut down those B cells if you're having too much target tissue um, insults, especially in the kidneys and so on and so forth. I talked about the lymphoma risk. That's scary as I'll get out. I talked about the mechanism. It's just this flogging of the immune system, which leads to uh, eventual sort of acquired um, auto survival, i.e. cancer. Um, this one's tricky. You know, there's uh, patients with um, hep C hurt. They sort of ache and pain on occasion. That's a myalgias and arthralgias. If it actually develops what looks like an inflammatory arthritis, that can also be a thing. And to really further confound your diagnostic purity, a lot of those patients can be rheumatoid factor positive. And again, what is rheumatoid factor? Rheumatoid factor is an IgG directed towards other IgGs. So um, it, remember, uh, it is an antibody. It's an aberrant antibody that's produced. So mechanistically, we, we certainly know that having aberrant antibody production is within the realm of hep C is sort of a wheelhouse number one, and just know that number two, they can present with a true genuine inflammatory arthritis, gelling phenomenon, swelling, synovitis, the whole works. And it can look just like rheumatoid arthritis, but underlying it is not a genuine autoimmune disease. It's actually hep C. Those patients tend to be CCP negative, rheumatoid factor positive, or, or sero negative altogether, honestly. Um, and, and what you'd want to do there is recognize it, not label them rheumatoid arthritis, not treat them with TNF inhibitors, not to give them methotrexate. You want to give them Harvonia, Clusa, or uh, Mavarite, or Zepatia, or something. Treat their underlying um, Hep C and 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 see if life gets better. I kind of talked about this one. I, the only purpose of this slide is to remind you what to test and in what order. So send rheumatoid factors on people, um, and uh, that's kind of a great initial screen. Again, it's a it's a marker of people who are prone to autoantibody production. And then if that's positive, you can go on and spend more money and do serum cryoglobulins. You can. Uh, do your SPEPs and so on and so forth. Um, and that's in people who you're just screening. If you actually had a person who presented like a, uh, with a cryoglobulin vasculitis, in other words, a rash, renal dysfunction, joint pain, that's not uh, a synovitis, you can go ahead and just order cryoglobulin straight up. Um, I can't say I see a ton of neuropathy, um, but I, I used to. Uh, I, I think I haven't had some one in a little while, but you can, you can see nerve involvement from hep C as well. And it tends to not be the peripheral stocking glove neuropathy of diabetes, but it tends to be more on mononeuritis. So in other words, a patchy, um, a, a patchy uh, asymmetric um, involvement. And uh, the skin, this one's fascinating. And it's uh, on occasion, um, something that you can literally diagnose a patient uh, walking down the store. You can, you can see their hands um, and, and, and hope that they got hep C screened and are aware of their diagnosis. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that hepatitis C can do to the skin. I've already talked about sort of the vasculitic process. And again, that's a palpable purpura type concept. It tends to be small vessel, lower extremities, um, but it can be other places. You can get some weirder rashes as well from hep C. Um, I don't classically associate enodosum or emultiformity with hep C, but you never say never. You know, you know emultiformity and enodosum more come from, you know, fungal infections and staph infections and mycoplasma and herpes, whatnot. But um, acute hepatitis do like to present with urticaria. That's more during the acute phase. Uh, but the classic ones um, for a chronic hep C is lichen planus and porphyria cutanea tarda, besides the vasculitis. So um, what, what they look like, this is uh, lichen planus. And it can be anywhere. It's shown on the hand here. But it can be intraoral. It can be genital. It can be just about anywhere. These sclerotic, scaly patches. And then um, porphyria cutanea tarda 
uh, again, is a disease process that is uh, nearly pathognomonic for hep C and represents with a blistering, frequently, uh, blistering of sun exposed and frequently traumatized areas of the body, which is often the hands. And you might get a history that patient blisters up and then scars and scabs down or scabs and then scars down. And you'll see this uh, sick belly as such in the, in the patients when you, when you look at their hands. We call them hep C hands. One of, one of several things you see on, hep, on the hands of hepatitis C patients, including um, some other uh, changes probably related to chronic injection drug use as well. And here's just a picture of sort of less active palpable purpura of, of cryoglobulinemia that almost can turn into what looks like freckled legs, almost uh, he, not dense like hemosiderin deposition, but like patchy freckles. Um, and again, if you get a history on those people, they often have a, a remote history where those uh, hyperpigmented patches at one point were more reddish and acute appearing. Um, summary, again, just wanted to finish on time, is uh, this is a systemic illness. We should recognize that there are a lot of non-liver related side effects. Um, all of this uh, rewards paying attention to uh, patients past medical, uh, their exam and their complaints. Uh, look at their labs, order TSHs, UAs, other endocrine labs, um, treat the hep C and see what gets better. And, uh, and I'll stop with that and please ask any questions you got. This is Kaylee. I don't have a, I don't have a question, but I definitely have a comment that as this whole didactic, you know, just went through, there are so many extra hepatic manifestations and there's no way to know all of them. And I learn new ones, the more cases that I see, like I just had a referral from DERM for a hep C related rash that they um, labeled papulo erythroderma of Ofuji, which is apparently an extra hepatic manifestation of skin manifestation of hep C. And I was like, I, there's no way I have no idea what this is. And lo and behold, there is data that supports it is. So, you know, I think the big take homes are going to be that you're not going to learn all of these. There's some really wild ones. Um, Big things are, you know, if you see something funky, yeah, maybe it's attributable to the hep C. We can treat this in two to three months so you can see if it gets better, but also recognizing the big things that you don't want to miss, like the cancers and um, the things that could be life-threatening to patients that um, may or may not be hep C related and may or may not improve with treatment. So just kind of be aware, you know, treat the hep C certainly, but also don't delay Um referring to specialists who can roll out, you know, the more serious causes too. But thank you, Dr. Gilfies. Beautifully said. And I agree with you. I learn every case that we see. And thank goodness for PubMed and Google. I just wanted to say um, two things. One is I'm, I'm thinking of a guy, I'm going to have to call back in because he he had something, he had a rash. I think it was on his hands. He said, what is this? Nobody can figure it out. So I, I'm going to go back and see him again. I'm treating him perhaps. He, he's actually still using injection drugs. Um, but at any rate, the other thing I wanted to say is I really appreciate the other thing I got out of your talk today is that my people who have been, who have been infected likely for 15 or 20 years who haven't progressed to fibrosis, this was a good reminder for me to think outside the liver. So thanks. Well, thanks, Jen. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions or comments on this? No? Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Gilfus, for your presentation. It's a great reminder for everybody, especially since, like you said, it can manifest in many different ways. Um, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Ariel. Oh, wait, that's a reaction. It was yes, sorry. Just giving some applause for the presentation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, just wanted to remind everyone, our next session will be October 31st. Um, tentatively right now, it'll be side effects of hep C treatment with Dr. Rachel Mitchell. Um, that could change, but as of right now, um, that's what we have on the schedule, but it is on Halloween, so that's always fun and exciting. Um, but if do you have anything, Kelly? All right, so it looks like we're going to wrap up early and give you part of your lunch break or day back. So thank you guys so much for joining, and we're excited for the next one. Thank All right, you. thank you.